to ten. Go ahead, everybody. One, two. All right. Good, 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 good. Um, we have uh, later on, well, actually, I'll introduce Bobby right now. Uh, Bobby Narcisse, Deputy Grand Chief in the Shinobiaski Nation. Uh, come on up. Give him a nice round of applause, everybody. Come on. Woohoo. Uh, thank you there, Brent. Um, yeah, good afternoon. Uh, I'm sorry I was supposed to be here this morning. I got some of my uh, schedules mixed up and all that, but uh, I really wanted, I really felt that it would be very imperative to come in and, uh, and, uh, and sit with you all as well and have some, have some lunch. And, and also looking forward to a lot of discussions that are going to be happening the next couple of days, with expect, with especially with uh, best practices. Now, best practices is a term that I always use as well uh, in other portfolios that I have. Uh, as you know, I'm, uh, well, I'm Bobby Narcisse. I'm your Deputy Grand Chief for Anishinaabe Aski Nation. And uh, one of my portfolios, a very important portfolios, is education. And uh, it's, uh, it's an area that is very dear to my heart, very close to my heart as well, uh, in terms of uh, working with our children, youth, and families, trying to improve outcomes uh, at the community level, recognizing and affirming all those various important partnerships uh, that we have across NAN territory with respect to many of our uh, education systems and also partnerships with uh, municipalities and, and how our students, uh, how our families could also benefit from, from many of those partnerships that are being happening as well. And uh, my other portfolios include uh, child and family services. Uh, as you know, like we've been making, uh, as Anishinaabe Aski Nation has intervener status at the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal, that found the federal government guilty against discriminating against our First Nations children with respect to resources and child welfare. Uh, so the same seems to be perpetuated uh, with education. You know, many of our students that come in from many of our 49 First Nations communities to, to attend various schools, uh, are not funded equitably, as you know. I'm, I'm preaching to the converted here, but uh, I know that uh, like we have to really maximize all those resources that are available to our students, but also uh, have an opportunity to really. Uh, it's an it's an interesting time where we need to start developing uh, our own education systems and partnerships uh, that are that are dealt in language you know, in our culture. You know, there's so many different uh, cultures and languages across uh, Anishinaabe Aski Nation, the 49 communities that we serve, the seven tribal councils that we work with. And uh, within that, that diversity, uh, I believe there needs to be a celebration of that, especially it has to be also uh, reflected within our education systems uh, as we move ahead. And it's, uh, and it's forms like this uh, that I really enjoy that, uh, that that's really happening about looking at some of the best practices uh, that are happening within education partnerships program. You know, how could we learn from each other? Uh, what are some of the ongoing challenges that still exist? And uh, what are some of those uh, successes uh, that we need to really build on uh, to really improve, uh, the, and, uh, improve the access, improve the, uh, uh, the education um, systems and all the partnerships that are happening to be more reflective of the true needs of our First Nation uh, students as well. I know that uh, many of our uh, areas uh, overlap uh, in terms of uh, a lot of the resources that are available. Um, I know that we've secured a lot of resources to our First Nations communities with respect to uh, prevention dollars, uh, with respect to uh, ban rep programs. Uh, with respect to the Choose Life program. You know, Choose Life is only indigenous to Anishinaabe Aski Nation communities. And we, even within that program too, like there's like our education systems that are uh, there to really enhance like land-based education programs, land-based healing, uh, 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 motivating our, uh, our young people to, to work with elders, all aspects of our, of our communities that makes us uh, who we are. Uh, and also encouraging the languages uh, as well. So uh, it's, it's my distinct pleasure to really be part of this process and help 
uh, guide the process as well. As you know, Anishinaabe Aski Nation uh, is not a government. We're, uh, we're an advocacy organization. So we take uh, all the different uh, ideas, uh, all the different uh, strategy ideas from you, from our leadership, and then we take them to our negotiating tables at all various levels of government. So, um, uh, as you know, that, uh, or I'd just like to mention that uh, uh, through my tenure uh, as Deputy Grand Chief uh, at Anishinaabe Aski Nation, uh, I have uh, managed to secure uh, a new reset table uh, with education. Uh, what, what is a reset table, you may ask? Well, it's basically a NAN specific process. We know that uh, Anishinaabe Aski Nation is very diverse in its needs. And, uh, you know, the pace of reform within education, within our communities, uh, is at a pace that it's been so slow over these years, you know. So uh, I met with, uh, I've established a table with uh, Minister Hadju uh, and also Minister Miller at the federal level uh, to really look at a NAN specific table where we're looking at all these different areas that are specific to uh, Anishinaabe Aski Nation. And I've also reinstituted re uh, our Chiefs Committee on Education as well. And our Chiefs Committee is also representative of uh, all the different seven tribal councils as well uh, to really reflect the diversity uh, in education needs and, and the have need wants of our education systems as well. So we're progressing in that area where, um, you know, we need to have an uh, Anishinaabe Aski Nation specific lens whenever we're talking about all these particular areas, especially resourcing EPP and, and how it's going to evolve and uh, how uh, best are we going to be working with all of our uh, uh, partners uh, within the various municipalities uh, in, in the years to come. So I look forward to hearing a lot of discussions that are going to be happening in the next couple of days and uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, give you some uh, words of welcome. And uh, like I said, our, uh, our door is always open in terms of if you have some questions or if, if there's specific areas to your uh, particular programs that uh, you wish to address. We have uh, Kathy here as well from our department. Um, also, we have Sherry Britton, our new education uh, director, um, and my staff as well. So uh, we always have an open door policy and uh, so uh, we'll continue to really look at and focus on why NAN is there for, especially for my portfolios, is there to really assist and really strengthen many of our education systems at the community level, but also uh, strengthen those partnerships uh, across the region as well. So with that, uh, I'm kind of hungry here, so uh, <laughs> thank you for giving me an opportunity to say some, uh, some words. I'll be around next couple of days as well, so miigwech. Okay, it's 12:19. Uh, I'll come back uh, very shortly to announce the, um, the different workshops that are going to be available. Again, it's going to be in the same th same three rooms. Uh, other than that, uh, enjoy your lunch, and uh, I'll be back on later. Um, I got a uh, complaint. Uh, somebody sent. Uh, to their uh, boss, a letter of complaint to their boss for, uh, about me, from one of the participants. They asked that uh, uh, they not do any more dancing. So uh, whoever that was, um, too bad it's going to happen again. <laughs> okay, that's that's how I am. I'm a very engaging person, and I love to move around. I love dancing. Uh, I I do c I can break out some busta moves and stuff like that. that that's how I snagged my wife a couple of years ago, a long couple of years ago. Okay, uh, I do have a couple of questions, or a couple of announcements to make, and then we're going to get right into the presentations. I know you're enjoying your break, but I'd like to get started right on time, instead of starting at 2:15, and we're going to go beyond. Okay, so we should be done by seven o'clock tonight. Okay, <laughs> I don't know why you guys are laughing. 
Okay, it's a quick announcement. Uh, delegate checks. If you are supposed to receive a delegate check for meals, mileage, or incidentals, they will be located at the reception, right where the um, uh, main area is. And then there's Mindy there. So Mindy, yeah, there she is. Mindy will be the face to give you the checks and stuff like that. Okay, so if you need, again, that will be after the presentations or any time you have uh, during the workshops, okay? Um, so earlier, before I sent you guys off for your, uh, your, your workshop, I mentioned that... Uh, I mentioned that people who over, I mentioned, sorry, I gotta get my, th my train of thought going here again. I mentioned de detentions are gonna be happening if you were late. So the following people are gonna be uh, in detention after workshops today. Uh, Cassie Turtle, Cassie Turtle, are you here? <laughs> See, she left already, all right, okay. Anna Fern. Yeah, Anna Fern, there you are. I see you. I know who you are. Eh? And Colleen. Colleen C? No? Oh, okay, she's a day. They left already. They left already. All right, so here we go. Just a couple of things here. And, oops. If you know the name of the singer or the band, Yell it out. I am so high, I can hear ever. No, not well. I will not say yes or no to that question or to that answer. Say it again. Chad Kroger is correct. Yeah, okay. Singer band. There's uh, two of them on this one. Bulletproof is part of the song, I think. That is Titanium, yes, but we're looking for the singer or the... There's two of them. David Guetta is correct, yes. Yeah. Okay, here we go. I'm losing my self-control. Yeah, you're starting the trip. Any guesses? Going once, going twice. We're looking for Katy Perry. Katy Perry, yes. I love, I love when I do... Um, I love when I do play this little game. I love the faces. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay, here's a couple more. What? Spin Doctors is correct. Yes. That's right. Okay. Vanilla Ice, yes. I promise that you'll never find Oh, there's a couple here. Taylor Swift is correct. That's right. Now we'll do a couple more and then we're going to get started with the workshops. And here we go. Oh, here's another one. Did somebody say Tom Cochran? That is wrong. It, it's, it's a remake. Oh, who said it? Rascal Flats is correct. Yes. Okay, here's another one. If you're a 90s baby or lived through the 90s, you gotta know this one. Part of the name is, is a number. No, it's not Will Smith. Matchbox 20 is correct. Yeah. Okay, this one here is for a prize, this next one. And the prize is right in my hand. Okay, I'm gonna pick a, pick a song here, something that's hard. Something that you guys will probably never get. Oh, here we go. I, no, that one's too easy. Oh uh, my goodness. Oh, here we go, okay. Whoever gets this one is gonna get this prize in my hand, okay? Tom Petty is incorrect. We're looking for the group name. Nope. Hmm? No, not Maverick. 
Traveling Wilburys is correct. Come on over here. Come on down and get your prize. Being beat up and battered around. Being sent up and I've been shot down. You're the best thing that I've ever found. I love how she was scared. She was like coming up here. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's continue on with the workshops. So fostering Indigenous student leadership. I'd like to call up Anika and Alexa to please come on up here. Participants will consider and build a deeper understanding about aspects of Indigenous leadership, how to create environments of Indigenous youth to live and succeed. Ladies and gentlemen, let's get them up here. I have two microphones for you, unless you want to use the podium. I didn't get a user manual for this. Uh, <laughs> Do you need a podium? We're good. I, I won't use a podium, probably. It scares me. <laughs> Podiums are intimidating. Okay, bonjour. Hello. Welcome. Um, I'll just get set here. We gotta establish a location. Um, as you may notice, my I'm getting over a cold. It wasn't COVID. I tested a number of times. It's a cold. And Crater's playing a bit of a joke on us where today's the day that he's like, you know what, you're going to lose your voice today. So, um, But I think it's really fitting because we're talking about fostering Indigenous student leadership and I'm here with my co-presenter. And uh, so she's going to have to carry the team here, which is pretty on point with what she does usually when I work with her. Um, so, bonjour. Uh, Oh yeah, I'm gonna work on this. I'm gonna just introduce ourselves here before we start. Mishkiki Ashki Wabagwan Indigenous, a Mikindodem Wikwemakong Nindongji Nishinabe Kwe and Dao. My name is Anika. Uh, that's my English name, and I very recently received my name from Creator, so that's why at first I kind of like forget. I kind of forget to say it, but I know that now, so I can use that in my introduction. <coughs> And uh, I have, I am a member of Wikwemkong First Nation, or Wikwemkong Unceded Indian Reserve. I've been living in the Thunder Bay community for about 13 years now, and I have been an educator for 16 years. <clears throat> Alexa couldn't believe that when she looked at my notes. Um, <laughs> and I began my teaching journey actually in a Nan community in Abmatong First Nation, and it was a beautiful experience. I spent two years there teaching, and then uh, moved to Thunder Bay with my husband, and I started teaching at McKellar Park School here in Thunder Bay for Lake Kip Public Schools, <clears throat> and then. Uh, for the last, since about 2015, I've been working centrally at Lakehead Public Schools to support Indigenous education. I started out as a resource teacher uh, and then became the coordinator for K-12 Indigenous education and then recently have ex has accepted a position of principal of Indigenous education for Lakehead Public Schools, which is a, a new role that didn't exist before, so it's, um, it's a learning journey and leadership for myself. And I'll let Alexa introduce herself as well. Hi, okay. I'm Alexa Saigature. I am Lakehead District School Board's Indigenous Student Trustee. This is my first and only term as Indigenous Student Trustee. Um, oh God, I do a hell of things, but we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna, you're gonna see what I do on the slides. But I'm from Yamateng First Nation, which is where Anika did um, her thing many years ago. <laughs> Sorry, I'm really giggly. We had a fun time singing earlier. And <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I do things. And yeah, I love my work. I love being a student. Why am I talking? We're getting to this later. <laughs> I'll talk about myself later. That's good. I feel like you've introduced yourself. You got it. Um, we want to just give an opportunity for you at your table groups to kind of consider the topic and engage your minds in what we're going to be talking about for the next little bit. So um, with the people around you, beside you at your table group, if you can share a word, maybe like the first word that just popped into your mind, 
um, when you think of leadership? I believe in you guys. Woohoo. Yeah. Okay. Do we want to do a little share bag? Like, what did would you guys come up with your your table members? Oh my God. Okay. Anika's gonna run around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think of students. When I think of leadership in 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 my my orbit, I think of my students and how can I put them in leadership positions. Love Sagi Wewe. Anika Hatch. Anyone else? I'm out here. I'm doing it. <laughs> um, I said humility. Heart. Providing service. Courage. Empathy. Oh, a uh, gold star for this table. <laughs> <They've> everyone <laughs> share. Do we Meek have wedge. Round of applause. <laughs> Hell yeah. Or as we say at Mino B, three cheers for that table. <laughs> Um, okay, miigwech for, for bringing that in. So um, recently I was exploring this book, Dancing on Our Turtles Back, um, for a book club that sometimes I participate in uh, called Anti-Racist Educator Reads. And there was a lot in there that Leanne Batas Max Simpson brings forward about Indigenous leadership and what that looks like and how it begins in our families and how we see it modeled through um, through the way it's used in our communities. But um, a lot of the time, we may need to kind of unlearn some of the ideas that we have seen as leadership and what that means, especially in school systems. Like when we think about leadership, it, it tends to be more about held by one person with all of that responsibility, like the principal or the teacher has all of that responsibility versus considering it as a more shared responsibility and everyone having a role and the goal of it being consensus building. So not just like that you have to make all the decisions, but that you're really trying to come to a place with everyone that's involved where everyone feels that's the right decision. And that's a, that's a tricky thing. And that's um, certainly with <laughs> some of the governments that we deal with, uh, that doesn't seem to be the way that leadership is taken in, in the mainstream now. So it involves a little bit of <coughs> unlearning for us. <coughs> um, and then this is a quote, <coughs> I've seen this floating around the socials a lot right now from Tanya Talaga's book. Uh, In Ojibwe and Cree culture, leadership didn't mean power, it meant caring. And so I thought about that in terms of what we're doing for student leadership and how we're providing opportunities to care for students and for them to be caretakers and to, to share what they have and their caring with each other and with other people. So I just wanted to kind of ground our conversation in that as we share a little bit about um, things that we're doing at Lakehead Public Schools to foster Indigenous student leadership. But before we go um, too far, uh, <laughs> and luckily, because I have very little voice for this part. Um, we're gonna share this TED Talk by Tenchai Redverse, uh, who co-founded the We Matter campaign with her sibling. Um, and it's really been foundational to the work that we're doing and the goals that we have for Indigenous student leadership at Lakehead Public Schools. So it's about 14 minutes long. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna go for the whole thing <laughs> and as I said, it's, it's been foundational learning. In that 14 minutes, she's gonna lay down some truths, some of those really difficult truths that help us um, understand the, the issues and the, the things that we see today happening. But then she's gonna move on and help us deconstruct some of those things 
and walk through how we can reconstruct in a better way in a, and build environments where Indigenous youth can live and succeed is some of the terminology that she uses. So we're going to uh, enjoy that video. <coughs> I'm going to rest my voice. It's Lanadea. My given name is Tanshai Redvers, and my spirit name is Wabamigunukwe, or White Feather Woman. I am Dene and Metis from Treaty 8 in the Northwest Territories. And I'd first like to acknowledge the traditional lands of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and neutral peoples that we are currently residing on. In October 2016, my brother and I started something called the We Matter Campaign. The We Matter campaign is a national multimedia campaign which communicates with Indigenous youth who may be struggling that no matter how hard life gets, there is always a way forward. Within a month of launching this campaign, we reached over a million people through our social media feeds. Almost a year later, we have reached additional millions, have over 20,000 followers, and are now a full-time Indigenous and youth-led nonprofit committed to Indigenous youth empowerment, hope, and life promotion. We started... <laughs> we started this campaign because Indigenous youth experience the highest rates of addiction, abuse, violence, school dropouts, and suicide in Canada. In fact, Indigenous youth die by suicide at a rate 5 to 11 times higher than non-Indigenous Canadians. This is a stark reality, and these statistics are incredibly problematic. But what is even more problematic is that Indigenous youth are the fastest growing population in Canada, meaning the current and upcoming generation of Indigenous children and youth will soon make up a large percentage of this country's population. If Canada's fastest growing demographic is also experiencing the highest rates of negative instances like suicide, then we are failing as a nation. So how do we change this? Well, we need to create a new environment, one where Indigenous youth live and succeed. And everybody is responsible for creating an environment where Indigenous youth live and succeed. So how do we do this? How do we all create an environment where Indigenous youth live and succeed? I'm going to share with you some ways that we can do this. But first, let's understand things a little bit more. You see, as an Indigenous youth growing up, I never quite understood why I saw and experienced the problems I did. I saw addiction, violence, and hopelessness in the communities and family I grew up in. And I've had my own run-ins with trauma, abuse, and suicidal ideation. It was only when I began to learn about the residential school that my grandmother grew up in did things begin to make sense. Through my own reflections, experiences, and work with We Matter, I came up with a way to visualize everything using the metaphor of a house. Imagine I am standing inside of a house right now. Above and around me, there is the roof and foundation of the house. This structure is oppression and colonialism, which includes things like systemic racism, the Indian Act, the taking of Indigenous lands and the removal of Indigenous people from their lands, residential schools, dog slaughters, and the 60 Scoop, to name a few. Within this structure, in this house where I live, there's furniture, appliances, everyday things. Imagine these everyday things being a loss of culture and language, violence and lateral violence, mental health issues and illness, stereotypes, abuse, bullying, trauma, isolation, and a lack of public representation. These things are a direct result of this colonial structure. As a young person living inside of this house, 
I'm like a human sponge. I'm soaking in all of these things. I'm soaking in everything around me. But I also don't know how to get out of the house. I'm kind of locked in. As a young person, I have some pretty limited coping skills. I'm also trying to deal with all of the general challenges that go along with being an adolescent, such as school and managing relationships. And because I am indigenous, there is a lack of support and resources, and especially culturally appropriate resources that are available to me. After soaking a lot of this in, I'm starting to feel pretty heavy, like a soaking wet sponge. I have just internalized everything, and I'm really lacking a sense of positive identity. I am now a young person who's feeling pretty lonely. I could be experiencing things like um, mental health, identity, self-esteem issues. I could be having uh, feelings of shame, depression, a sense of hopelessness. And I'm turning to things like drugs, alcohol, self-harm, and suicide because I don't know what else to do. I've been at this state before, and it's a really hard place to be. And as a young person, a lot of the time I'm feeling and experiencing all of these things without understanding why. This has become my normal. I don't realize that there's this structure, this narrative, this environment that has created the ongoing context and reality in which I live. However, there is an alternate environment one that is nurturing and supportive of Indigenous youth and is structured so that youth live and succeed. This decolonized structure includes things like affirmation and support, relatable role models, and the challenging of current norms. Public discourse and media does a really good job at affirming the negative the hopelessness of Indigenous communities and youth. But what if we affirmed the positive? What if we fostered local and national narratives that focused more on the beauty and strengths of Indigenous communities and youth? What if, instead of headlines like this, we saw more headlines like this? Supporting youth means centering youth needs and voices. Nobody knows what a person needs most, more than the person who needs it. Indigenous youth need to know that they are heard, that they are valued, that they are supported, and that they are loved. Growing up, I had a really hard time believing that Indigenous people could be successful. I had a hard time seeing positive role models that I could relate to. Musicians, actors, doctors, entrepreneurs, engineers, politicians. Indigenous youth need to know that there is hope for them to succeed and be connected to positive and healthy role models that they can connect to both personally and culturally. There are two norms that still exist today. One norm makes it really difficult to talk about complicated and taboo issues like mental health and abuse. Yet young people need to know that it's okay to talk about their experiences and struggles, because if a young person doesn't think that it's okay to talk about something, then they're not going to ask for help. The second norm favors supports and resources that are rooted in Western perspectives. But effective programming, mental health, and well-being resources for Indigenous youth need to be approached from an Indigenous perspective. OK. So if we are all responsible for creating this environment, exactly what are some things that we can do to build it? Here are three things that you can do. Number one. Learn about and understand the historic and present context of Indigenous communities while acknowledging the hardships and barriers that Indigenous youth face today. 
This means actively seeking out indigenous authors, academics, journalists, artists, and media. There are tons of resources and indigenous created content out there, from poetry, to novels, to music, to movies, to podcasts, to magazines, that all speak to authentic experiences, both past and present. Even better, visit physical places. Visit a nearby First Nation, a friendship center, or tour an old residential school. Number two, actively honor Indigenous and youth strengths. This means directly asking youth what they need, giving them a space at decision-making tables, at round tables, promoting youth-led initiatives. Invite them into boardrooms, show up for them at their events, at their suicide awareness and water walks, and ask them what you can do for them. Engage with Indigenous youth and promote positive media and representation. Don't just scroll through, click and share posts and articles that talk about overdose, death and suicide. Rather than perpetuating stereotypes and hopeless, hopelessness, find and share articles that promote positivity. If you're in media or reporting, then interview youth. Report on the hopeful things, amplify the strengths and successes, the tribe called Reds, the university graduates, the people who create We Matter videos. What you choose to engage with, talk about, and share has a ripple effect. Number three, support the indigenization of youth programs and resources. Invest in supports and resources that are specific to context and identity. Specifically, programs and resources that are rooted in tradition, land, language, and culture. Invest in mentorship programs. Work with indigenous groups to create indigenous-specific mental health content. Review your funding models to ensure that they are culturally and youth accessible. Donate to community projects and groups. Prioritize indigenous and youth-led projects. And write to local MPs and national leaders about the importance of supporting indigenous-led and rooted action. Write those letters and speak up. More importantly, accept indigenous and youth knowledge as expert knowledge. Hold those voices up. These are all things that can be done. These are all things that you can do. Now imagine that I am a young person standing inside of a house. Above and around me, there is the roof and foundation of the house. Within this house, there are things like resilience, pride, positivity, love, truthfulness, strength, culture and language, hope, representation, unity, confidence, coping, and opportunity. Like a human sponge, I am soaking in all of these things. This is my reality. This is my normal. As individuals, as families, as communities, as a nation, we all play a role in creating environments. We can choose to perpetuate a negative and toxic environment that exists for Indigenous youth, or we can build a new environment that honors and supports Indigenous youth and sees them live and succeed. So which structure, which narrative, which environment do you want to be responsible for creating? Marcy Cho, thank you. I, I always, um, it's hard to listen to the introduction to that video, the part where she's, you know, talking about the realities and the house <clears throat> that we're in right now. Um, but I appreciate that she shares and names the reasons for those for that house and what that looks like. And then 
moves us to starting to reimagine how we can rebuild a better house for youth and for for everyone but especially that's her focus is the youth so um i think about we're going to share a, a few things that we've been doing in lake public schools to to promote indigenous youth and empower them and grow them into the leaders that they already are um <clears throat> and one of them is a program that we run called Mino B. So we're going to get there. But a really important part of this, this structure, this first house that she outlines, is um, helping people to recognize it and helping the youth that are just living there, like, sh like she explained in her story, to see it. And so um, I know for both Alexa and I, we have, you know, we have stories of coming to understand and start to see the house for what it really was. And then we're able to start to deconstruct that house for ourselves and rebuild a better house, right? And so for, for myself, I grew up um, mostly without my, my father, who's Ojibwe and Odawa. And he was an alcoholic for most of my childhood. So living in, like, this is the house that I was in, that I saw that trauma, that alcoholism, you know, those things were very much a part of my life. <clears throat> and then when he was, I think I was, I was 13, he went to a traditional healing lodge and he, you know, found that, that good red road, as he calls it, and he was able to, he also somehow in his addiction got a political science degree. And so when he, you know, was walking that good red road, he was able to start to teach my brother and I and start to help us to see the house and the furniture that we had been living in and identify it and name it and start to move that stuff out of our lives. <clears throat> and um, he, he always said, he did a lot of cultural sensitivity training. He worked in um, child welfare. <clears throat> and he always used to say in his circles in his training that what we have become is not who we are as Anishinaabe people. And I think about that being like, that's how we break down this structure, understanding that the, the house that we've lived in has created is a result of years of oppression and colonialism, the house that we're living in now, but recognizing that that's not who we are. That's really not our house. We've been, we've been you know, misplaced. <laughs> we've been, misplaced isn't the word I'm looking for, but. Anyway, so that's kind of my, it, it's, it's through my dad's journey that I was able to start to recognize that house and, and um, understand it, and then you start to change your furniture. But Alexa's going to share a bit about her house. Hello? Hello. Okay. Yeah, so similarly to Anika's story, I, um, I grew up surrounded through a like addiction and anger and it was never something that I questioned because it was my normal and you know is the house that I grew up in and I think my moment of realization was being able to go to experiences like these alongside my mother who is who does who is a community advocate for indigenous peoples and it's through her work where I was able to you know sit so maybe not at the table, but you know, just kind of at the back and just kind of listen to, you know, the truth and like listen to all of that unpack and be like, yeah, okay, I see this in my life and this is why it's there. You know, this, but that doesn't mean that I am any less because of it being there. But that was sort of my coming to realizing of the house that I live in, the oppression and colonialism house. So we're going to draw your attention back to the three main points that Tun Chai makes in her video of um, affirmation and support, what Indigenous students need, or Indigenous youth, relatable role models, and challenging current norms. And as we talk through a few of the examples that were things that we're offering to youth in our school board, um, we'll kind of come back to these things. But before we do, Alexa has Ooh, another job for you. We do. So. Uh, I have some big questions for you guys, <laughs> and it's not that much. You can, you know, converse with your tables, but we're, I was wondering, what are you doing in your role in education to build the environment for Indigenous youth described by 
what's her name? Tanchai, thank you. So, like, what what are you doing to support the indigenous youth? You know, following the L oh, it's gone. But <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I was referring to the other slide, but I was like, anyway, yeah. <laughs> what are you doing as an educator to support and nurture indigenous youth? So I will bring that to the tables. Our, our friend Brent had a good question over here, although it sounds like they're already talking a lot, but he asked if we're referring to individually or as a group. So um, I think any of those, if you're with friends from an organization or a school that you work with, then share that way. If it's individually about your role, share that way. Um, yeah, just kind of sharing, because I know there's a lot of people in this room who are already doing some incredible things and it's good to get some ideas.
there are some really good, great conversations happening. <clears throat> um, I wonder if anyone is feeling like they want to share back with the group some of the things that you were discussing, ways that you're working to build this house for the students and youth that you work with. Oh, there was like a lot more talking than that when we were at the table. <laughs> Blank stares in the... I'll go, I'll go. Alexis, I'll, 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 she's hey gonna guys. come pick on someone. <laughs> hey guys. I might just pick on you guys because I was sitting with you guys. Okay. Okay, so um, as she was kind of asking, uh, everyone at the table here is we uh, come from a lot of uh, different backgrounds with uh, the careers that we're working in. Like I'm a project coordinator. We have a, a teacher and nurses and trying to, you know, see the, the, um, the similarities with uh, what we're trying to do for uh, uh, youths and young adults and trying to provide more support and education. Uh, and as I was saying to her is um, making them feel uncomfortable, but in, in a good way to help them kind of uh, uh, to grow. Um, but that's all I can really say. <laughs> Thank you. Hell yeah. Okay. <laughs> she means me Gwetch. Oh yeah, <laughs> me Gwetch. <laughs> Actually, here you go. You can go. I love it. Um, we were over here talking about how to meet the student where they're at um, while also holding space um, for their own growth and how we all do that in one way or another um, and consistently fight. Um, what did you call it? The colonial construct? Yeah. Yeah, outside of the social norm and then I'll go terrorize this side of the room <laughs> just find find one more person or table hey guys <laughs> what's up you guys want to mic <laughs> hell yeah okay um, what we were discussing is here is um, how do you uh, change that perspective like where uh, to be in is being in the city, going to the theaters and and putting it on the other foot and say, you know, most of these kids here in the city haven't even had the opportunity to run through a field, jump in a boat, pull out a 12-gauge gun and shoot that moose and skin it right on the spot. You know, we have to change that perspective that being in the city is not all it. You know, going to the theaters and the, the what do you call it, the, the roller coaster rides and all that. You know, and, the, and that's where we have to change that that uh, perspective for our young people. We have it made, man, because this is our country and we have everything at our disposal except that it's been taken away on, say, this is what we need. We need a, sky, a skyscraper. We need this. And meanwhile, we have everything. So we have to change that. And knowing that traditional knowledge goes a long way. We were talking about how everything that's applicable in the school system, math, geology, science, and we take it in our backyard. We learn how to uh, navigate the rivers. We learn by the stars. We know when to set up our blind, when the winter, when the spring is coming. We see it in the animals. And when you switch that around, man, we're very smart people compared to Europeans. So give them that. Aho. Miigwech. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> I think that really speaks to the challenging current norms part too. What what we accept as being, you know, aspiring to get to, um, it's it's different. So it's shifting that dialogue. Oh, <clears throat> again, I'm going back to my Leanne Simpson. It's my it's my current favorite book. So there was this quote in the book that I read that said. We need to make sure more of our babies, children, and youth are making it to the top of their hills. <clears throat> that they are healthy and full of life once they get there. That they have made it through their struggles using Nishnabeg ways of being, and that they have cared for others on the way. And when we talk about leadership and that being of caring, it's how are we providing those opportunities for our youth. And so one of the um, programs that we started in our school board in 2015. We call it uh, Mino Bamadzwin. It's an indigenous youth leadership program. 
And um, I really feel that it, it does this for the youth. It gets them there. And when Tenchai talked about, you know, the many of us are probably not surprised by the um, numbers of youth suicide, indigenous youth suicide. That's what she's talking about when she brought this quote into the book, that idea of how do we get those youth to the top of that hill, of the four hills of life, and they're not only they arrive, but they're healthy and that they understand how to um, overcome struggle in good, healthy Anishinaabe ways. And so um, Mino Bamadzwin, it's a youth leadership program that we run in the summer. We offer it for students in grades 7 to 12. Alexa started in that program when she was in grade 7. And uh, last year, she was a mentor. <clears throat> And so it's a one-week immersive program, but students are always invited back to, well, a number of them. So it's not just like you come when you're in grade seven and then you're done. You kind of become part of that family and then you keep growing through it. It is made possible with a number of community partners. Um, the Thunder Bay Indigenous Friendship Center being one of the most prominent. They're with us, um, with their Indigenous youth workers the whole week. Um, Lakehead University helps us out, the Thunder Bay um, community police officers and the Indigenous Liaison Unit are there. <clears throat> uh oh, I'm losing my voice. We do trick them into doing some learning through mathematics as well, some math learning through beading. Um, and this year we did birch bark basket making and connecting the mathematics that are in there. Um, because like, like, I think it's Joyce, like Joyce said, you know, our knowledge is in all of those things and we just have to make the connections and tie it. And then all of a sudden students see they are mathematical. <laughs> they are inherently mathematical. They are scientists. They are all of these things, but they're not like a textbook is not how they learn those things. It's not, it doesn't translate. So <clears throat> I'm not going to go through the whole schedule here, but um, this is kind of a week at a glance of our program. <clears throat> and the mornings start with um, circle. So when, I'm gonna go to this, uh, when we think about the morning circle, I think that's really where we're bringing in that affirmation and support. On the first day, we unpack some, um, some things about understanding the bundle and what we're doing. Every morning we open with a, a smudge, a tobacco prayer, uh, strawberries, and a water ceremony. And the, the students lead that, the youth lead it. Um, the mentors kind of teach the new students what, what the importance is and all of that at each step. And then we address different topics through the morning circle. So the first one is really just getting to know that Mino Bamadzwin, looking at that good life and understanding the pieces of the bundle that are there and the teachings that we, that we have and carry. And then the second day, <coughs> we look at uh, history and unpack so that's where we do a lot of that like showing them that furniture from the original well from the house that we've been handed down now that house that we're living in as a result of colonialism and i actually bring my big brother to do it because he's pretty cool and he has a really good like session where he <laughs> lays it out for them so he really unpacks what that history is so that students can start to recognize the furniture in their lives and they can start to make those connections and we do it in a really safe way where we're in circle, where they have a chance to share, where they're supported through Nishnabeg ways of caring for each other. Um, and then the, sec the third day, we talk about um, grief, because all of us carry an incredible amount of grief. And even if it's not personal, grief, because of tragedy, because of suicide, because of um, drugs, the grief that we carry as a collective in that circle, we talked about the day before. It's the grief from the history of colonialism in Canada. So we have that shared grief. And when we talk about col challenging cultural norms, <coughs> sometimes our circle, in that grief circle, or the next day we talk about, we've named it Mino Bamadzwin, but really we kind of talk about all those things that take us off of that path of Mino Bamadzwin. So things like drugs and alcohol, Things like phones and our addictions to technology or addictions to gambling or any, you know, those things that can take us off of that path. Um, and we share through all of that. But in those circles, when you talk about challenging cultural norms, there's some <clears throat> non-Indigenous support staff that are with us 
that work for the school board, and they're so uncomfortable with crying. <laughs> we are so uncomfortable with crying as a society. And so it takes a lot, like, I don't know how many times we say, don't apologize for your tears. Those tears are healing, and they're doing really good work for you right now. And we allow, we create this space where we can share those tears and, like, honor them, value them. And, you know, the, the cultural norm is to, like, stuff that down, put those tears away. I'm in public right now. I can't share that. But um, some of our circles, you know, I plan them for, like, an hour, and then three hours later we're still in there. And I remember when some, one day this summer, we're still in circle, but I had to just like run out and change lunch and tell people that we were still alive and then <laughs> go back in. And the, the, there was police officers there that day. They were coming to do um, archery after the circle. <clears throat> and they were like, first they were sitting in there and then they were outside. And I, when I went outside, they're like, is everyone okay? <laughs> I'm like, oh, they're so good. <laughs> <laughs> they're so good. It doesn't look like they're okay right now, but oh, that, that circle's doing so much important work because they bring their stories and they share them in this safe space where they are like, this is the furniture that I've been dealing with, and they can put it down. And then they can start to rebuild the house the way that they know it should have been from the beginning. Do you want to talk about anything? Uh, yeah, so with the circles and the morning, like the morning circles definitely give affirmation and support. And I think, you know, at, at these circles, I definitely have done a lot of my healing at these circles that I've witnessed and been able to be a part of the journey of healing for, for other youth. Um, I'm actually in the picture right there, guys. <laughs> I'm, I'm the, yeah, I don't know if you can see it, but I'm the one in the brown pants. That's me. Um, those were... <laughs> <laughs> Aside from me, those were a lot of our youth this past summer. Being able to go back as a, a mentor. Wait, this is the next slide anyway, okay. Um, but during, you know, the circles, you really see these youth step up for each other and support one another. And even support, like, our, what's the word? Support people, support staff. They're even going and supporting them. And it's such a space where... You know, we are laying down our furniture. We're saying, this is what we deal with, and, you know, it hurts me. Share me a bit of what, you know, share me a bit of your story. And I think going in with an open mind every morning and willing to learn ab about other stories and willing to share of your own stories is the ground of healing. And I love that we get to be able to do it in the morning, you know, it's our... We start our day with our healing and our telling of our stories. Flip, I'll flip back to the schedule just so you can see. <clears throat> and then in the afternoon, we pack in a lot of fun. <laughs> we do, um, like we go canoeing, we do archery, we do beading, we make baskets, we have bonfires in the evening. Um, you know, we, we build each other back up. <clears throat> so in the circle, we really take time to recognize and acknowledge the furniture and the house of oppression and colonialism that we're, you know, most of us are stuck with still. And then through the week, we also create that, that other house, that decolonized environment where we're there for each other, where we have relatable role model, models, where we're, you know, not, not necessarily uplifting the colonial norms. We're challenging them and creating a space that is full of culture and language. We have language instruction too. Miss Bannon has been there and, and, and Charlotte has spent some time at, at camp with us. Um, so we're really trying to rebuild that house and it's incredible. It happens in a week. They, they rebuild it and then they become family. Um, relatable mo role models, as I said at the beginning, we can't do this program without an incredible amount of community support. So my, my big brother Joel is up there on the I love how we're using technology there. We've put uh, a brown paper over top of the smart board <laughs> and he's drawing on it. Um, <clears throat> really advanced. We have different Kokums. There's Kathy uh, Baxter is up there who comes and teaches them how to make, uh, it, it just cook on the open fire. They make bannock dogs and um, she just hangs out like all day when we're out there at Kingfisher and they bring, there was three generations of them this year there just leading the students. Um, and then we made ribbon shirts and skirts this year as well. There was an army of aunties that came to help and make the ribbon shirts. And so 
students can see themselves in all of these different areas depending on what their skill sets are. They become leaders in different spots. Some of them have real, a lot of skills in sewing, so they're able to step up and be the leaders in that space. Um, and then on the, the picture on the bottom right, <clears throat> those were our four mentors from this year. So all of them had been involved in the program since it began in 2015. And then all of them are there this summer leading in some way. And it just depends on what their gifts are. So um, Athena, who's standing up in that picture, she came back as our photographer because she got a new camera. She was feeling good about it. She wanted, to, that's her role. She doesn't want to necessarily like, hold the clipboard, that's what we call it. The clipboards give you a lot of power in my program, just so you know, <laughs> in that Mino Pumatsuin program. So the, she didn't want that, like leading a group, but she wanted to be involved and lead in, in whatever way she could. Also, that's where we found out she's an incredible beater, and then now she's been coming into schools and leading workshops uh, in a lot of our schools. And then, um, like Alexa, though, she gets a clipboard. You've seen her. She, gets, <laughs> she leads the group. And then if I need someone, I'm like, wh where is the South group? And I need you to go find this student. And she'll run and do it. She'll call the attention. She'll lead the games and the breaks. That's part of her gifts. She has that. Um, and Darylin is in that picture, too. This summer, Darylin's going to come back as a circle support person. So they kind of stand, they sit outside of the circle. And if, if anyone has to leave the circle at any point, you know, they just want some space, they want some air, we have a lot of helpers that will go and just sit with them and make sure that they're okay and just care for them because that's the way that they lead. And so that's, that's kind of what Daryl Lynn does. So we provide so many of those role models that you can see people ahead of you, um, older than you, or with millions of different skills in that space. Hello. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, so I was able to, as you heard, Anika, to go back this past summer as a mentor. And for me, it was really like a full circle moment because I, you know, this was the probably a major step in the beginning of my reconstruction of house journey. And so it was really awesome to be able to be a part of that journey for other youth. And any chance I get, I talk about these youth. Like, I, <laughs> I, I love these youth, and Amika is laughing at me because I'm referring to them as these youth as if I'm not a youth myself, but <laughs> they are my youth. They're, I'm, I look at them and I see the future, you know. Again, they're only like three years younger than me, but they are the future, and I have so much hope for them, and it's really, it was really powerful to be in that space and to be with these youth, and I'm like, you guys are just... I'm not going to say that word because it's unprofessional. But you guys are doing great. You guys are working and you're doing amazing for yourselves. And I love Joel's presentation. It's the thing that I look forward to every year. It's the one day where I'm like excited for it the most. And you know, having our community partners come in and be with us on a daily, it's very, um, I would like to, um, I had mentioned once before that uh, having the police there with us and you know most of the times they're not in uniform they were in uniform this year which is kind of odd but it definitely made me more comfortable with police which is you know <laughs> it is a thing but having these genuine you know friendships with these role models and you know and they're so kind and cool and I loved going as a mentor please bring me back next year, Anika. <laughs> You'll be back. <laughs> yeah, I mean, woo. <laughs> um, all right, and I've, I've spoken a little bit to the challenging um, colonial norms, cultural norms, um, but I thought I'd share this one picture because one of the biggest ways that I think we do that is that the, chil the students, the youth, become the leaders, like, by they're there they're there the whole time they're really like they t they kind of take control so i really like this picture because it's little little pluto leading that leading that um, morning circle with constable constable simon there and being the one that takes the smudge around and leading in that way and that's that's one of the really important ways the other is that we kind of like you saw my nice week schedule and it's a great plan but we also just kind of do what needs to be done and 
don't necessarily, you know, like a school day is very strict. You gotta stick to those schedules all the time, but that's one of the ways we challenge the, that's what I'm telling myself anyways. This is how I challenge the norms, <laughs> is by being late for everything. <laughs> Until they stop serving us lunch because we missed it. But that only happened one time. <laughs> um, so, oh, oh yeah. Do you have more to, about Mino B before we? No, I'm good. We're good? Yeah, okay, I'm good. <clears throat> Okay, so that we started on that journey, as I said, in 2015, and COVID interrupted it because we really can't move a program like that online. The, something that's really critical is that we're together the whole time. I would not feel good about having those morning circles and then sending them home and not, not knowing how they're being cared for in that space. So we are together. 24 seven and we really make sure we're on a journey and the last couple days, you know, we're watching students and we follow up during the school year with that group too. We have, um, we had some circles. Uh, we hosted one at Westgate where we brought the students there, and, you know, just little check-ins to remind them about the things that they learned. Um, another thing that we're doing in our schools is we have school-based indigenous student leadership groups. So at, we have three high schools <coughs> and at each one of them, there's um, a student-led leadership group, and it's, it was started very organically. Uh, students just kind of wanted to start to gather, to start to put on events and things. So a lot of the time during, like on the second slide, I think there's a treaty week display. The students at Superior wanted to put that up and display that. Um, they planned a whole weekend retreat for themselves at our outdoor education center at Kingfisher, one of the schools. Um, and they've had day trips. And one of the really cool things that happened at Superior was they worked a lot in partnership with the student council. So it wasn't like competing groups or segregation, just doing their own thing. They shared and worked together with each other. Um, we're running out of time. Yeah. So uh, another, another thing that we do to lift up these voices is we have our Aboriginal Education Advisory Committee and we have student representation from each of our high schools there. Yeah. Um, I'm there, right there. <laughs> but yeah, it's very important to have these student representatives because as an Indigenous student trustee, I like sit on the committee and it was very a different energy when I had these, you know, supports of student representatives because my first meeting, I was just kind of, I was the only student there and I was like kind of awkward, I'm gonna be honest. But then the second time around I came and I had student representation with me and we did so good. They literally, they literally change the space in the room when there's more of them. So that's one of my learnings is that don't leave them alone when you're bringing a student to be a voice at a table. Give them, give them some strength in numbers because otherwise we can just tokenize their voice. That's what happens if we just give them one seat at the table. Um, and Brent's giving me the wrap it up here. So we also have an Indigenous student trustee. This is her, Alexa. Hi. Yeah, so this is just, I'll just go really fast. So this is some things that I do. I have a secondary student center between all like the high schools and elementary schools. There are senior students. I attend meetings and advocate for the voices of Indigenous youth represented under the board. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going really fast. In this picture, I'm at a school event. Um, it was very nice and I was speaking with the grade four fives of the school and they were telling me very much at that milk prices are too much. So I, I went over to the room where the other trustees were and I was like, hey guys, you will not believe what the grade four fives just told me. The milk prices, absurd. <laughs> no. No? Okay. <laughs> That's it, scratch it. Um, also a number of opportunities for mentorship. You saw me no be. We've had them volunteer at uh, Reach Ahead credits. They do co-op placements, peer leadership credits, um, very involved with the Regional Multicultural Youth Center to give them mentorship opportunities. And uh, this is pretty much the end where I'm just, from, from an adult perspective, what I've done most to support the Indigenous youth is just say yes and show up. So they'll. This example that's up there, Alexa called me last year, like FaceTime me in the middle of the day and said, we want to do something for September 30th. We want to sing a song instead of playing O'Can on the announcements. We want to have a drum circle. 
can you come and bring your drum and help us out? And I was like, yes, I will just show up and do that. And then they make beautiful things happen in their school. That's, that's pretty much all we, we have to say. I'm just going to share those as resources in case you want to write them down because they're um, really good documents. There's this one and that one. <laughs> and that's all. Miigwech. Yeah. Just to let you know, my son attends Hammersville High School, and uh, I just noticed on one of the programs that they offer is the Reach Ahead program, and he attended uh, right before he went to grade nine, uh, and he got a, his first credit, and then he went into grade nine, he got his nine, now he's like one credit ahead, so I thought that was pretty awesome. So again, uh, one more time for Alexa and Anika, please. I'm just going to move their, pa their papers down here. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to call upon our next presenter as great success supporting FNMI student transition, transitions to high school. I'd like to welcome Victoria Matthews and Jennifer Hall up to the stage here, please. This is yours, eh? Yeah. Okay, now do you want two the mics? podium or two mics? Do you want two mics? Uh, okay. Two mics? What do you want? Doesn't matter. That's easier. Hi. Two, two mics. Okay. Please, or do you want to talk at the podium? What do you want? What do you want to do? Yeah. I do. Is this a clicker? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to assume that one needs four minutes. Okay. Um, first of all, I hope at least one person got the Borat reference, the great success, right? No? Pardon? The Borat reference, great success. That's what it's referencing. Were well, you not aware of that? I just let you take the lead. Because nobody's seen Borat. It's so funny. Fine. Forget it. Grade eight. Yeah, right? Thank you. Hi, Buju, Tanchi, Wachi, everybody. My name is Victoria Russell Matthews. I'm the Indigenous Graduation Coach at St. Patrick's High School. And I am Jennifer Hall. I'm the Indigenous Graduation Coach at St. Ignatius High School. So, welcome. We are going to be introducing ourselves, and I'll give you a little bit of an overview of a presentation in just a moment here. So, as I mentioned, my name's Victoria. I am Métis. I was born and raised in Thunder Bay. However, my family on both sides is from our homeland in the prairies. My grandpa, I was actually excited because our keynote was talking about Battleford and that's where my grandfather grew up and my dad's side of the family is from Saskatchewan and Saskatoon where I still have a lot of families. So I'm an uninvited guest outside my ancestral territory. I've been very fortunate to live and work in Thunder Bay within the fields of mental health, post-secondary education and within the developmental sector before coming to the Catholic School Board. A little bit about myself, I'm very much into gardening. I raise butterflies in the summertime, which is what I like to tell people. That's two of them. Or, yeah, two of them that I had last year. A little guy named Rockwell. So that's him in the middle there. And I've got a dog. That's the face she makes when I catch her eating drywall. So she's extremely bad. Uh, and she woke me up three times last night. So I'm sorry if I seem a little tired. I am. All right, good afternoon. As I said, my name is Jennifer Hall. Um, I am a settler here, uh, I guess, in all of Canada. I have Polish and British ancestry. Um, you can see on the pictures a little bit about myself. I have a cat who I absolutely adore. I accidentally adopted him four years ago and I'm obsessed. And then I have a camp um, on Winnegustiguan Lake in Treaty 3 territory. It is um, kind of off the grid. I, I love it. It's my favorite place to be and just kind of connect with loved ones and the land. Um, professionally, I have my Bachelor's of Education and I have experience working in um, Indigenous education with Lake and Public Schools, youth programming through the youth, Inclu youth Inclusion Program, and now I am here at St. Ignatius as a good coach. 
Awesome. So a little bit about the presentation that we're going to be giving today is we will be going over a little bit what the grad coach role looks like, at least with the Catholic board. It's a role that the public board has as well. But we're going to be exploring how that role and how other roles can adapt some of the methods that we use to build relationships with students and their families to help ease the transition into the high school environment and beyond into the school year. So the goal of this role, it was funded, I believe it was rolled out at 32 school boards uh, several years ago. So now they're all over the province, which is awesome and it's to establish trusting relationships with students and their families uh, and increase academic success and retention and this approach has actually been adapted several times so I know our board, our board uh, consulted quite a bit with Kiwait and Patricia and in turn in Canada it did start in Edmonton Alberta but it was adapted from a model in the US that did support black students and we do see a lot of overlap in a lot of the societal issues that do uh, that those students do face. However, in Thunder Bay and in Northwestern Ontario, everyone's quite aware we have a lot of unique geographical issues, including the fact that we have students who come from remote communities, away from their families, away from their homes, possibly for the first time ever. And that adds a layer of complexity to these relationships that we're very cognizant of. At the board ourselves, we work very closely with our Indigenous counsellors. Their role is more based in terms of mental health support, whereas ours is more academic success. It's very much a complementary role. We're fortunate to have them both. But on top of that, we do have strong relationships and support uh, with what we call our circle of caring adults, which would be school administration like vice principals, principals, families, caregivers, our counsellors. And again, that role's actually been with our board for about 25 years now. So we're going to talk to you a bit about what this role looks like throughout the year each season because this is a full year responsibility that we have when it comes to supporting these transitions into high school then we're going to share some of our relationship building methods that we implement to build that strong foundation and ongoing relationship with these youth and their families so to start off one thing about the grad coach program and the role is that it's much it's very much a proactive um, approach to supporting indigenous youth in school so we really focus on building overall supports for students in grade eight and grade nine so that by the time they reach grade 12 they're on track to graduate they have their appropriate credits they have their volunteer hours if something comes up they know the supports that they can go to to kind of make sure that they can still graduate so it's very much a proactive approach to getting increasing graduation rates and you'll kind of see that as we go through so starting off in the winter that is when we begin our grade 8 transitions we invite our senior elementary schools to come into our spaces once a month once a month starting in january running through until may Students spend the morning um, in our schools and in our spaces working on various activities. And we'll go a little bit more in depth in our transition sessions later on. We continue student check-ins. We do start them in the fall. And we run student check-ins throughout the school year, kind of depending on our students' needs. We also start to prep our grade 12 students for that transition into post-secondary school, making sure that they're aware of any deadlines, whether that's their funding for, from their communities, bursary and award scholarships, as well as college university applications, making sure they know how to fill them out, where to get them, and what to do. And then we just assist students with course selections as well, so ensuring that they know their proper prerequisites, they're in the right stream, and they kind of have all of their boxes checked off moving throughout high school. So a couple of these photos that we have here in the center there, you can see a mural that's actually painted on the wall in the room attached to my office. So I'm on the third floor and the room looked a bit like an interrogation room. It had no windows, there's this ugly fluorescent light, blank walls. So I reached out to one of the art teachers and asked if they had any students who had maybe poor attendance or weren't comfortable going into class, see if they wanted to work on helping to create and paint this mural. So it was completely student designed and led. I'm just the person with the P card who went and picked like, pick the paint up. And I offered tobacco to our Ojibwe language teacher, Esther Daibo, who is also a fluent language speaker, to name the room, which is now Nabadua Nibwakawin, which means strings of wisdom. And as you can see on the corner there, we have a couple of kids who were working on it when it first started. And the other photos are from St. Ignatius High School, and we invited community organizations to come in for lunch and learns. So two of the photos are from, from when Anishinaabe Mishkiki came in. They did a woodland teaching and let the students paint their own woodland art. And then the other one is Thunder Bay Public Library came in, and the students made talking sticks and got his talking stick teaching. 
So in the springtime, that is when our transition sessions continue. As Jen mentioned, they start in the winter. We do them in January. That's when students are kind of settled and ready to go. And each workshop has a different focus, including mental health, pathway planning, and academic skill building. And we pre prep for the incoming uh, students, the next cohort that will be coming in. We do this partially by reaching out to the Indigenous counselors at the senior elementary level. We'll ask them kind of, what students do you think we should be prioritizing when we do our outreach in the summer? Who needs the most support? What is the family dynamic like? And what can we do to support them? And I will also mention that we do have like a 12-month ministry guideline portal that we follow. It has kind of an idea of what we should be doing each month. So there is sort of, there is that consistency, consistency throughout the role. Uh, this, these photos are from St. Pat's. We have an Indigenous Student Council there and one of the initiatives that we did last year for Red Dress Day was that we put a call out to the entire school to come paint their hand red and add it to uh, the Bristol board that we had as a way to not only raise awareness for Red Dress Day and for missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, but also to stand in so solidarity and say no more stolen sisters. And we had an excellent turnout. We filled out about five of those Bristol boards and had a really, really great response from the school. It was, it was gladdening. Our grade eight transition doesn't end when school ends. So we do have a transition or summer camp that we host for our grade eights coming into grade nine. It's the Ashki Bimazni Banesiwa Cultural Camp. So that runs throughout the summer. We will also kind of go more in depth onto what that cultural camp is and what we offer and the support it provides to our grade eights coming into high school. We continue our outreach to families um, in the community. So we work a lot with our Indigenous counselors at our senior elementaries and they kind of will identify students who are more at risk and will benefit a lot from the additional support. So reach out to those families and students, say if they want to meet up, go for coffee, have lunch, and just start to build that relationship in a very relaxed environment that's outside of the school setting just to help prepare them for when they come to school, we're already a familiar face to them. We also prep our spaces for the school year, so just making sure it's ready for a new round of youth to come in. And we offer individual school tours and timetable review for any incoming youth. So we'll reach out to um, any families and youth that are identified to us as incoming into our schools. They come in, we walk through the school with them one-on-one, -on -one, kind of show them the flow of the school, find their classes with them and go over their timetable because a lot of times this is the first time students will ever see a timetable. They don't know how to read it. They don't know what the break between classes means. They don't know how to read course codes. So we go through that timetable with them and find other classes, trying to remove as many unknowns as we can for the first day of school. I struggle with those timetables still sometimes also. It's like CGC 1P1 and all those. It's like, it's like a different language. Uh, I hope I'm not talking too quickly also. A Starbucks double shot and a cup of coffee so I can like see through time right now. Uh, in the middle here is one of our initiatives that we currently have going. Anwa has been coming in every Thursday to do ribbon skirt making with us. Something that we're very cognizant of is a lot of our students don't have any connection to culture. They don't have any access to the supports to get to learn these kind of things. So we want to make that available in our environments. It's low barrier. They're already at the schools and we're going to talk more. I keep, um, we're going to say that like 18 times. We're going to talk about this more later and we will. But just so you know, almost coming in every Thursday making ribbon skirts. That's mine on the bottom. <laughs> and the other photos are of a field trip that St. Anisha's got to take. Last year, it was really nice to get out of the school because we did still have COVID restrictions, so we did have limitations. But we got to go to the Thunder Bay Art Gallery to visit their Ingenuity exhibit, and students got to experience and explore the traditional ways of living of our First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people. And then our other, the student on the, this side, um, got to do some water painting and paint with blueberries, and it was a fun experience to get them out of the school. So in the fall, that's when we begin our check-ins with grade 9 students. That first check-in that we do is a little more thorough. Uh, we call them one by one to our offices, where we sit down and kind of get to know who they are and what they need in terms of support. What are the things that they like? What do they dislike? What are their struggles? What, are, what do they succeed at? And we want to make sure that we're getting to know them well. So I might ask a question like, if you could go anywhere in the world right now and you didn't have to pay, where would you go? And that might tell me a lot about a student. If a kid tells me Japan, then I know they're probably a fan of anime and manga. It's a jumping point. If they say, I want to go to Europe, I'll say why. And that's giving me just these little ideas. Who is this kid? And what can we connect over when we have these conversations? And other check they're based on student needs. If a student doesn't want to come see me once a month and sit down in my office, we can pass each other in the hallway and I'll be like, you good? They're like, I'm good. And I'm like, awesome. Come see me sometime if you want. But 
don't if you don't want to. It's completely voluntary. We don't, nobody is forced to engage with us. And after students have settled, uh, we begin the cultural and academic activities that are like outside of classes because we want to make sure there's already so much change happening in terms of the timetables and figuring everything out. And now there's like 80 kids around you all the time. And we want to make sure that you have about a month to settle into that routine before we start bringing speakers in, before we start doing anything else. Uh, on the left there is another initiative that we did at St. Pat's with our student council for Orange Shirt Day in the fall time. The culinary class is kind enough to provide a ton of cookies shaped like little shirts with orange icing and we sold them at lunchtime and the Indigenous Student Council chose to donate the proceeds of that sale to Our Kids Count. We wanted to make sure it went somewhere in the community that was low barrier that provided supports and services to children and youth and their families. And the other photo is two of our lovely St. Ignatius students. Nan came in during semester one to do a student safety presentation and also brought in community organizations to come and share information with this youth. So though it's just a fun picture of two of our students who were able to participate and they got some fun swag from community organizations. So a little bit of a group exercise that we want to ask you to think about as we talk and we circle back to it at the end if you want. Do you want to do that responses now? We, we acknowledge it's the end of the day, and it's been a long day, so we're going to try and like get Think about this. it. Yeah, <laughs> popcorn style. First word that comes to mind, what does a safe space in a school look like? A, ca a couch. You, in the yellow shirt. Yeah. Exactly, cultural, a place that's for them, exactly. We have cultural rooms in, I believe, five schools now, one in each of our high schools, and then a few of the elementary schools as well. What's that? Uh, Lyndon has a cultural room too. Oh, Lyndon has a, I'm talking about our board, Lyndon. All right, they have cultural rooms as well though. They're fantastic and that's one of the wonderful things is that we can connect with a public board as well. If I have a student who's going over to Westgate for whatever reason, I'll say, well the good news is, is they have a grad coach there. His name is Lyndon, he's an awesome guy and I might, I might connect those two uh, via email or whatever. Or were because you saying food? Or we, oh, he was saying food. <laughs> I'm not wearing my glasses, I've seen enough. <laughs> I thought it made me make me less nervous. Anyway, anyone else? Safe space, food, a cultural room, a couch. Okay. <laughs> I have a couch in my office. I love it. Um, plants, yes. The library, exactly. And it's a nice, calm. It's an open space. It's a place where lots of people can sit. There are couches. I love a good sit. That's what I'm trying to say here. We want somewhere where they can relax, where they can get nourished, where they can have a space to call their own. That's probably three pillars that we need for a safe space, and that's something that we strive to provide. All right, so a large part of this, the grad coach role is that relationship. Um, being a safe adult for our youth in the school, someone that they can go to and rely on and trust and advocate for them. So it's really important for us to have stable and strong positive relationships with our youth. And we do that through a number of different methods. And one is acting as a liaison between school and families and removing as many barriers for those families as we can. So we both have work Facebooks that we use to connect with students and their caregivers as a way of communication. Not everybody likes talking on the phone. Not everyone has access to a phone or an email. So it's kind of taking away as many barriers as we can to still have communication with a family that they're the most comfortable. We also like to use the two by 10 method, which means you might have a student in mind that you want to connect with. And that means you're going to spend two minutes or as close to two minutes as you can for 10 days in a row, just connecting with that students in different ways, whether it's saying good morning and acknowledging them. How are they? Oh, the weather. Asking them a question about their favorite movie. It's just connecting with them for two minutes a day in 10 days to build that consistent relationship with them. We also like to help build their confidence and bring them into conversations with their peers if they're shy. So like Victoria mentioned earlier, if you have a group of youth in your office space or your space, it kind of asking a question or having a conversation that can bring them all together. So a new student who doesn't know anyone at the school starts to establish those relationships and at least those peers become familiar faces with them. We'll help them build their confidence by walking them to class. High school can be really intimidating. It's a much larger space. You have way more classmates. There's so many more people in the hallway. Navigating yourself through a new school and busy hallways is really scary. So going to class for the first time and meeting a teacher won't, is not fun. So we'll walk with them. We're happy to introduce them to the teacher, kind of send them off on a positive way into class and just help them get through the halls. They can be very chaotic. I avoid the halls as much as I can. So I can't even imagine being a grade nine in high school for the first time. 
And then lastly, we support them through their self-advocacy. Self-advocacy is one of the biggest things that we strive for in our roles and building them up to be able to advocate on their own. So it might be something as little as being like, can you email my teacher and let them know that I want to get caught up because I was sick? And the first time we might be like, yeah, for sure, we'll send that email. But when it's like the second, third, fifth, seventh time, we're like, no, let's write that email with you. And so they'll send it from their account and we help them write that email. And then hopefully eventually they'll be able to go to class and be like, hey, I was sick for those three days. Can I get my missed work? But it's starting, it's building them up from the bottom because we can't expect them to walk into a classroom and say, I was sick, can I have my missed work? So we help build that advocacy with them. I also love to do BuzzFeed quizzes with kids. I'll be like, guys, who wants to find out what kind of pie they are? And if they're like, I do, I do, I do. And I'll be like, I'll email you the link. And we all do the quiz together. And I'm like, I'm a key lime pie. And someone else is like, I'm also a key lime pie. You know what it means. You know. You know. Anyway, <laughs> building confidence. Because confidence is something that we see a lot with our youth. At the start of the year, we see a lot of this. We see a lot of this. We, we don't hear a lot. And sometimes these relationships are very slow burn, which is something that we're very aware of and respectful of. But we want to help build that confidence. So we want to celebrate the victories. And those victories can look completely different depending on your youth. Maybe uh, getting a test with a 50%, celebrate that victory the same as you would if someone got 100%. That's awesome. You passed. You were saying that you didn't think you were going to pass. And look, you did. I have, a, I have a cork board in my room. I'll be like, hang, hang it up. That's a superstar board, and you pass that test even though you think you would, so hang that up right now. Uh, well, if they want. <laughs> you show interest in their interest and follow through. Ask them what bands they like. What's your favorite movie? What kind of shows are you watching right now? And you might learn that there's something that you like too. There was a band that one of my students was extremely into, and they were talking, talking, talking to me about it all the time. And I looked them up on Spotify, and now I have three of their songs on my own playlist. But it also gave me the, the ability to connect with that student on a deeper level because I'm showing them that not only did I listen to what they told me, but I actively took the time to follow through with that and make that connection. And that meant a lot, and it does always mean a lot. And acknowledge their struggles. Sometimes when you're a teenager, you just need to hear, that really sucks because it's hard to be a teenager. It's even harder to be in high school because to us, you're going to be like, nobody cares what your hair looks like. Nobody really cares what you're, what you're wearing. But they, they do. They feel that. And they do care. And it doesn't matter if nobody else cares because they do. And so we need to acknowledge that those struggles exist and tell them, it's hard to be a teenager and what you're going through right now is really hard. And I'm here to help you. So we want to also flip that script on negative self-talk. I'm never going to be able to do this. I'm never going to be able to pass this test. Well, why? Why? We can talk through that anxiety. Is that worry based on fact? Um, what is the worst that can happen? But what's the best that can happen? And highlight all the people within this circle of caring adults that are there to help them succeed. I'm never going to pass this test. Sure you can if you study, and I'll help you. You need to be their cheerleader and be there for them and basically be the positivity that they might not have the ability to recognize yet. Our transition sessions, so I've kind of mentioned them earlier, they do start in January and this is where our foundation to transitioning our students into grade 9 really starts. So we start by reaching out to our Indigenous counsellors kind of in November, December, asking them, coordinating dates, making a plan, they kind of gather a list of self-identified students at their schools and we go from there. So January was our first session, this is an outline of the sessions that I'm running. January, because I bring together two of our senior elementary schools, Bishop Gallagher and Bishop E.Q. Jennings. So we really focus on bringing students together. It's two new schools, they're in grade eight, they're shy, they don't really want to talk to new people. So we do little activities to kind of start to break them out of their shell. We also break them into groups of four to six, with half of the group being from one school and the other half from the other. They might not become best friends, and that's okay, but at least they have one more familiar face come grade nine in September when they walk into math class. It's a familiar face. It's one more familiar face than they had prior to our transition sessions. So we do a welcome, get to know each other. We kind of start to go over the introduction to high school because it's way different than what they have in senior elementary. You need credits. You need hours. You need to know how to read course codes. You need to have a uniform. There's so many new things, so we start to prep them and introduce them to those new ideas and get them used to it. Um, then we go on to February. Community partnership is a huge part of our role. We can never do this on our own, and having our community partners and our school staff involved is so important. So in February, I had the Youth Inclusion Program come in, 
and they did the whole session with our youth. They did an awesome team building activity where each group had to protect an egg with paper towel and tape. They dropped it from a staircase and we saw which egg lasted the longest. That encouraged communication, strategies, kind of bouncing ideas off of each other and got the students talking to one another. Even though they're from different schools, they have different interests, it kind of forced them to start to engage with each other. Um, in March, I actually have my transition session tomorrow. Victoria has hers next week. So we are going over high school activities. I have a little checklist where they're gonna check off anything they're interested in high school. So what sports teams do they wanna do? What clubs are they interested in? And this lets me know, come next school year, that when those start, I can say, hey, don't forget, this tryout is on this day, I know you're interested in it. Or hey, did you hear on the announcements, this club is meeting at lunch in this room. I know you wanted to go, so just be aware. And I'm happy to go with them to those things, because again, it's scary. So I'll go with them for the first you know, one, make sure they know the teacher, they know where to go, and they have an idea of where it is. And then, again, just going over school support, so starting to build up those supports and get an idea of who these youth are, what supports they have, and maybe gaps in their support system that we're gonna need to fill at the school. Then we go into April, I have Anishinaabe Mishkiki coming in, they're gonna do a few activities. Again, just building that community relationship, and those connections with our youth to the community. And lastly, in May, we're going to look at some mental health, kind of give them strategies, coping strategies, come high school if they have anxiety or they're really struggling. What are some strategies that you can work with and go into the school year? And a school scavenger hunt. So they're gonna get out throughout the whole school, kind of in their small groups. So they can get a feel of the school, see how youth interact in the hallways, find classes, get a flow, learn the stairways, find the bathrooms, and just be more comfortable in the school overall. Um, these are just two examples of some of the worksheets that we'll do. So the About Me has just general questions that really lets us get to know a little bit about them and we can start to have those conversations and it's nice to have when we go into September and we start to do those student check-ins because it gives us something to talk about if they're a really shy quiet kind of guarded student we can kind of refer back to this and say oh did you watch any good horror movies over the summer I know you really like that and start to pull those questions out of them and kind of challenge them to start to get to know us We know it's power through. It's the end of the day. It's the end of the day. <laughs> Building relationships with caregivers this is a really integral part of creating the relationships with students because we want to take a family centric approach to what we do. So we do that starting the summer, reach out via phone to introduce ourselves, introduce what our role is, and we offer an in person meeting where we provide like a meal or coffee. We might, and, and I let them choose. Do you want me to bring you a pizza? Do you want to meet at Starbucks? Do you want to meet at Tim's? Wherever. And we pay for it, by the way. I also make that known. But it's not just about inviting them, it's about, it's about inviting people within the household. Uh, whatever caregivers are there, whatever siblings they may have because we want to show that it's not just the student success we care about it's the family success as well and we can help families get connected with resources that they may need as well uh, if there's six kids in the house then I can reach out at Christmas time and say we're putting together our hamper list and kids are expensive I don't know how many parents are in the room but we can say would you guys like one or we can say if you ever need help accessing clothes or food or whatever you need in the community please feel free to reach out to me because I'm connected to a lot of resources and I can help be a conduit for that uh, we welcome or we create an online connection as Jen mentioned via Facebook we have our work ones messenger is way 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 easier uh, we may have an instance where I had a student away for about a week and a half so I messaged the mom and said I haven't seen so-and-so around is everything okay just checking in oh yeah we had a death in the family I haven't been able to get around to calling the school that's when I can step in and say I will have those absences excused I will let the office know when they're coming back give me a heads up and I can you know talk to the teachers and everything it takes one little piece of way away from a family who may already be like completely overburdened with everything that goes on outside of school and we want to give positive updates because how defeating it would be if you have a youth who has attendance issues who has issues with their schoolwork getting four four uh, four phone calls at midterms your kid is failing, your kid is failing, your kid is failing, your kid is failing. How that must feel.
to constantly get calls like that. And so it might be reaching out to them and saying, today at the fall feast, so-and-so really helped us out setting up. They're always a joy to have around, and we love to see them in the cultural room. It might be, today at this event, uh, we had a really great time, and -and so-and-so participated in this event in this way. Giving an idea of, like, what are the good things that their young person is doing at the school to help kind of create a more positive connection as well, because we don't want the only communication from the school to be like, your kid never shows up and they're failing. Awesome. As if they weren't already aware of that, right? All right. Our summer, or our cultural camp, this is a big part of our transition into grade nine. So we do share about our cultural camp at every transition session. Really get that idea into the students' heads. Try and pump up our attendance. We work with our Indigenous counselors quite a bit on getting students registered and enrolled. And again, they help identify those youth that, that are more at risk and would really benefit from a stronger relationship with school staff. This camp has been running for three years now. Victoria ran it one year online um, during COVID. And then when I was hired on the board, we've now ran it for two summers in person. We didn't really have a name for it. We, we kind of changed it every, every time we like said it. The Indigenous it. Cultural and Language Transition, Transitions, Wellness, wellness Fun Summer like Camp. Names. It was awful. So we reached out to our Ojibwe language teacher, who's also community elder, Esther Diabo. She came and spent some time with us at the camp, and she gave us our name last summer, the Ashki Bimazni Benesiwa Cultural Camp, which translates into New Life Thunderbird. Um, we're very thankful to actually finally have a name and kind of connect to the culture and give students something that to be proud of and to say, I did this. So students who participate do get volunteer hours towards their graduation uh, requirements, which is just trying to take that barrier away from graduating. Graduation, getting your volunteer hours can be quite difficult when you have life going on. So we do give them hours for participating. Our long-term goal is to get the camp credit bearing, but that takes a lot more um, than just Victoria and I saying, you get a credit and you get a credit and we all get credits. So we're starting off with volunteer hours. And the main focus of the camp is for students to make connections with school staff and community members in a relaxed and calm environment outside of the school settings. We don't run the camp on our own. We invite a ton of community partners in to spend the morning, the afternoon, the day with the youth so that these community partners become familiar faces with our youth. That way, if we have ANWA or Mishkiki or Youth Inclusion Program staff there, maybe they'll see them out in the community and it's a familiar face. They might want to attend one of their programmings and they already know what to expect because they've been there, they know the staff, they're familiar with what what to go through. And again, we just want to make it a safe space for them to build a relationship with their peers. We also have our school social workers at our camp, the high school ones. This allows the students to get to know the social workers in a non-clinical, relaxed environment so that if something comes up during a school year and they need that extra support to talk through, they're familiar with them. They played football with them. They played pickleball. They did activities. It's not a social worker. It's a safe person that they can connect with. And the other thing about the camp is we try to make it as low barrier to access. So we reach out to the families to see if they want to register. We don't just send a flyer home and say, call us if you're interested. We'll send emails, letters, phone calls. We reach out to families and follow up to see if they want to register. We also provide transportation because we acknowledge that transportation is a huge barrier in this city and for a lot of families. So we ask parents, hey, do you need transportation? Yep, we arrange it and we have, um, we use driver's seat to go pick up the youth in the morning and drop them off at night. And then our next initiative, um, because we're hoping to just continue to grow this camp even more, is to have a youth-led logo. So last year we got our name, we got some hoodies, hats, and t-shirts to give out to the students. Our name is on it, and our next step is creating our our logo, and we're kind of letting the youth take the lead on that one. All right, so here's a couple of pictures from our camp throughout the years. On the left-hand side there, we were hand drumming in Vickers Park. Uh, I bring my hand drums all the time in case students ever want to do so. And a woman had approached us and said that she was part of a women's drum group, the Thunder Bay Women's Drummers with uh, Fort William First Nation. And she asked if 
she could put out the call to her fellow hand drummers to come and do a session with us. So they did come in and Sheila Decord is part of that drum group. We were at Boulevard that week and she provided us with some water teachings as well. It was really amazing. And I just want to say that the camp is about two and a half weeks long. And because we have students from both sides of town, what we do is one week we do it at Vickers Park with our cultural room at St. Pat's as the rain location. The second week we go to Boulevard with the Ignatius, oh, like Ignatius <laughs> uh, culture room is that rain location and then the last day or the last week we do things like roots to harvest or off-site programming and on the very last day of camp we have a big gathering with everyone all of the caregivers all of the siblings we provide food we sing we have just an amazing time so in the middle there that's Martin White he is the indigenous counselor at Pope John Paul he joins us every summer to provide teachings he typically talks about like the importance of respecting yourself and respecting others and he just has this really gentle kind soul that youth really connect with and on the right there that's Esther giving her Ojibwe language teaching which we do once a week with them as well so at Boulevard we did a, uh, an Ojibwe scavenger hunt we had a list we walked we pointed out things and said the words in the language it's amazing so this slide is just more activities from our cultural camp we have two pictures of our students at Roots to Harvest Roots to Harvest has a wood fire pizza oven in their backyard so we go and spend the day there and students prepare all of the food. They cook their own pizza. It's a really nice way to kind of gather around food and also students learn a little bit about cooking, nutrition, and just kind of safe, safety in the kitchen. So we have two of our youth are grating cheese and then the bottom we have youth cutting up the peppers and getting the salad prepped. The middle picture is just students hanging out playing a card game with one of our school social workers. One of the things about our cultural camp is that we want students, A, to want to continue to coming back every day and for it to be their own space. So we never force students to participate in an activity if they don't want to. If they're having a bad day, if they're nervous, if it's just not something that they like, we don't make them come in and, and participate. If they're like, hey, today's not my day, it's like, yeah, it's all good. Go sit under a tree, watch the clouds, listen to music, play on the swings. We never force them to participate in anything they're not comfortable with because they want, we want them to feel safe and comfortable with us and in the space. So that's something there. They just kind of wanted to hang out, have a chill afternoon. We're like, yeah, go for it. And then the bottom picture is Victoria led um, some hand drumming. So it's, you can see there's students kind of journaling in the back. Some are just sitting by a tree listening. Others are drumming and just sitting back relaxing. Then the top photo is three of our boys from last summer. They all go to St. Ignatius now. Picked up some hand drums just on their own. We had them out, just if students wanted to. And the three of them, who are quite humorous um, mm -hmm. and wild childs, the one walked Boulevard barefoot because he insisted on letting the dogs out. Letting the dogs out. They picked up the hand drums and just started drumming on their own. The dogs were barking. The dogs were barking. <laughs> So, and he's barefoot there, but he, he's hand drumming um, together. It's, it's so nice to see them come together and build those relationships. And we were like, yeah, man, that's connection to the land. Scientifically proven that our bare feet against the grass is something that's really important. But just watch out for glass. That's it. You know, just kind of let him go do something. <laughs> These are our youth-led logos in the making. We've had one workshop. We brought together a small group of students, I think there were six of them from the past three summers that we've run our cultural camp and talked about the camp, what it meant to them, what they liked about it, what they gained about it, asked, hey, like, what didn't you like? What would you have wished we'd done? There was like nothing that they didn't like. Right? More that. Perfect. Um, <laughs> and so we kind of went over what the, what the logo or the name of our camp means, the translation and what it means to them. And these, this is from our first session. Students did their own ideas. Um, we're going to do another session to kind of bring it together now. But it was, <laughs> it was nice to see their creativity. We had some young students who art is not their forte, but they still participated. And we actually love their ideas. Yeah, that's a bird with teeth in the top left corner. I really like it. So. A little bit of our circle carrying adults. I mentioned that phrase earlier. So that is made up of basically everybody that wants to see this young person succeed. So that would be school administration, like vice principals, principals, the indigenous education leads and superintendents if it's necessary, the teachers that are involved with the, that particular students, 
guidance counselors or the student success lead if that's applicable, uh, the indigenous counselor, ourselves as the grad coaches, possibly the school social worker and any caregivers. That communication is really important. We need to make sure that we are acting essentially as a safety net in case any of these kids fall through one of the gaps that exist in the system. There are gaps, we're there to help close them. And so we want to make sure that we're all working together to be sure that these kids are uh, getting the best ch possible chance at success as possible. It's your turn. I didn't see you change the slide. It happened so fast. Yeah. yeah. Can I Support say it? I'm efficient. <laughs> Supporting academic success is a large part of the graduation uh, coach role. We do focus on academics. Moving into high school can be a large adjustment for students. For the first time in their educational path and journey, they can be unsuccessful in a class. They can have to retake a class. If they don't hand in an assignment, they get a zero. If they don't attend, that's an absence, and it's one last day that they have to succeed. So it's a big, it's a lot of space or gap to fill, and it, it's a big transition for our youth coming into grade nine. And so part of our role is to assist students with quiet workspaces. I have an office. Victoria has an office. We also have two cultural rooms, resources room, wellness room. Students, especially who come from smaller communities, northern communities, coming into a large high school with a class full of 30 students, especially in the D streams, because we now have all sorts of youth in one class, all together, different learning levels. A classroom can be very overwhelming and a very hard place to learn. You have loud, energetic students in the back yelling, screaming. You have an anxious student in the front. They can't do their math worksheet. So we help coordinate that with our school administration and other school staff, whether it's their special education teacher, a guidance counselor, indigenous counselor, to arrange for them to have a quiet space to work. That might mean that they stay for the lesson and then they go and work in a quiet space for the rest of the class. That might mean on some days they go check in and say, hey, I'm here, can I have my work? And the teacher's like, yeah, okay. We help coordinate those conversations because on some days the classroom's just not the right space for students and we understand that. So we'll send the teacher an email, say, this student's having a bad day, they're gonna come check in, can you just give them their assignment and they're going to come and work with me? And we make sure that our school administration and any part of the circle of care adults is aware so that students not getting punished for having a bad day. Um, we also connect with school tutors. We have a program with Lakehead University's Niji Mentorship as well as other community organizations who offer tutoring. We'll bring them into the school. They can do virtual in-person learning, kind of help filling that academic gap and making sure that they have the additional support that they need because there is a gap from COVID, and now with the D-Streams, we're seeing even more that students are really struggling in the classroom. And we want to be able to help support them in any way that we can. D-Streaming and COVID has turned education into, it's like a nightmare, Ruined by our the lives. way. So, I don't even want to talk about it. I'm going to start crying. Uh, <laughs> so our community partnerships are something that's really important, and our goal is to increase the engagement in both school and ed community for local organizations. That's mutually helpful because a lot of these organizations have their own ministry reporting to do, just as we have our own. So we, everybody kind of gains something from this. And we bring these partners into the school to help reduce that barrier, but also help students get to know the staff at these organizations better. Because say, for example, that ribbon skirt making, Mom was also doing a jingle dress making workshop. And so these kids who might not be likely to go, now they're seeing the staff from Omwa every Thursday, and now they might be more likely to sign up for a workshop like that because they know who is going to be there, and it makes it a lot less intimidating to go. Some of the other organizations that we do partner with, I already mentioned Alma, the Thunder Bay District Health Unit, Anishinaabe Mashkiki, as we mentioned, the Indigenous Friendship Center, Thunder Bay Public Library, uh, NAN, also, they came to our uh, summer camp last year as well. We had an amazing time playing this one language game with Larry Beard. It was hilarious. And we basically look for anyone and everyone who would like to come and make these connections with students in, in an environment where they're comfortable and accessible. And just to add, so we do this through the uh, Lunch and Learn. Mm -hmm. We offer our Lunch and Learn, so we invite our students to come into our spaces. We give them lunch and they gain a volunteer hour for participating. They volunteer their lunch to learn about a community organization, to participate. So again, just trying to remove that barrier of grad one less thing to worry about come graduation. So that's through our Lunch and Learns. Yeah, so if you have any questions, does anybody have any questions? No, that's okay. <laughs> and, but if you have any later, there's our emails. Does anybody have any questions or compliments that they'd like we to share? We are willing to answer them. Yeah. We will. We'll stay. We will. <laughs> yes. If, is that possible? Maybe. No, I think that comes from us. From mine, <laughs> what, but Nan has everybody's emails. Oh, true. 
you come see us at this table here. <laughs> I give you an email. I'll share it with you. If anybody would like that, I'm sitting right there and Jen's sitting we're right there. We were late, so we were front and center. <gasps> I was prepared to see myself on that screen. <laughs> it was a jump scare. Anyway, um, we're 50 minutes. Yeah, oh, yes. Oh, I would love that. I would love yes. that. Yeah. And in fact, I would love to see it from K to 12. <sighs> um, so as far, I don't, we, so Tisa Fiddler would kind of be the person for our school board to talk to. Um, that is something that we can bring to her, though. Um, that is something we can bring to her and say this came up during our conference and, and people said it, it might be helpful. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Anybody else? Like a roadmap, it would be fantastic. It would be like we, like I said, we have a like a month by month guide. So something like that, a year basis, would be amazing. Yeah. And we finished early. You're welcome. Think about those safe spaces. Think about it. <laughs> Clap. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, what they did? It's that coffee. Uh, one more time for Victoria and Jennifer, please come on. On behalf of the Nishinaabeaski Best Practice Committee, we'd like to uh, uh, give you a little gift here. So, Jennifer? Yes, thank you so much. And Victoria. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. Thank you very much, ladies. So, uh, this concludes the uh, <clears throat> for day one of Best Practices First Nation Education Forum. I do have a couple of things before we, I let you guys go, okay? Uh, first of all, Victoria. Victoria Matthews, any relation to Austin Matthews? Yeah, Austin Matthews is uh, 34 for Toronto. I just thought I asked. No? Okay. Uh, Jennifer Hall, uh, any relation to Taylor Hall? No? Oh, darn. That's 0 for 2. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I have to say, Lakehead and, and Catholic school boards, you know, you guys, the, the students are lucky. The students are lucky with all this programming that's happening, all the program that you that you guys saw from both from the uh, Lakehead and from the Catholic school boards. I have to say the students are lucky this generation. When I was here in Thunder Bay, grade, uh, grade 10, 11, 12, we did not have that opportunity. We didn't have that many programming. We did not have that, some, that many supports. I'm really proud to see that our students today have so many people on the sidelines that are there in this school, the grad coaches, the, you know, the, the, it's amazing. It's, and you guys came far, and I'm really, really happy for their students. And they're, they're, there are more and more graduating students this, as they come along. And it's really great to see. Uh, one more time for the Lakehead and Catholic School Boards, please. Give them a nice round of applause, please. Thank you. I uh, just want to say thank you to our keynote speaker, uh, Kendall Netmaker. Thank you very much. Uh, our elder, uh, Barney Batiste, and all our workshop facilitators. So let's give them a nice round of applause, please. <clears throat> Did anybody get any response from this morning's activities uh, from the Operation High? Remember, you had to write out a compliment and send it off to somebody? Did you get any responses? Did anybody call back? When you called somebody, because no word of a lie, I did this at a, um, I did this at another um, function, and I had uh, this lady from Kisatchewan, and she apparently I didn't know this, right? She she had some underlining issues, and uh, what I did, and I did the activity. I said this, but this time you get to phone four people, so that's what she did. She phoned four of her kids. She says, "Oh, I love you. I love you. See you later. Goodbye." And she did that four times. The kids all called back, thought that she was passing away. <laughs> and so I try not to do that. And so I just try to, I try to keep it to uh, the, the compliment thing. So, <laughs> okay. So I'm going to review tomorrow, and I actually have a special message to uh, the grad coaches, the Catholic school board, 
and Anika, I need to speak to you guys after, before, um, when I'm done here, when I dismiss everybody. There's a program, I'm going to kind of mention it, okay? Now, this is coming up this year, uh, Saturday, June 3rd. I'm organizing the third annual Ride to Remember event. It is a, uh, an event where we raise awareness for the, un, um, for the children in unmarked graves that were discovered by residential schools. So this year, it's going to be our third year soon, uh, on Saturday, June 3rd, and I'd love to get the students to come. So stay, I want to add more information so if you guys can stick around, okay? Uh, okay, I'm going to recap. Breakfast tomorrow at 8 o'clock. Okay, it starts at 8. Uh, your schedule says be, we're going to start at 9, but be here at 8.50, 8.50, not 815. 850, and we'll get started. We'll get going with the thing. Uh, we have a keynote from Patricia Ningawans. We have two panels. We have a trade show and presentation near the end of the day. So that's that's tomorrow. I'm just going to sum it up really fast. Okay, keynote, two panels, trade show, and a presentation. Okay, to, uh, just to let you know, those of you that are, uh, who's from out of town here? Who's from out of town? Okay, who lives in town? So pretty much everybody. Okay, bingo starts at 6.45. Okay. <laughs> Casino is open till 2 a.m. <laughs> okay, but I do not encourage you to go. Anyways, have yourself a good evening. We'll see you tomorrow. If you have any questions, oh, delegates, if you're still waiting for your checks or meals, mileage or whatever, uh, go to the main, uh, the front office there. Uh, sorry, there's a little, you'll see them. You'll see the sign as you walk by. Okay. And uh, snacks are still available, and I'll see you tomorrow at 8. What time? That's right. We're going to get started at 8.50, okay? All right. Oh, and if you're, if you're on TikTok, I posted the video already. Yeah. And guess what? Two views. Yes. <laughs> okay, so I will see you guys, and uh, Catholic school boards, and Lincoln, come over here, and we'll, we'll have a little chat. All right, I'll see you guys tomorrow. Have fun. Merry Christmas and happy birthday. I'll see you tomorrow.